Consciousness, the final frontier. These are the voyages into the universe universe between your ears. ears. Our mission, to explore collective wisdom, seek out amazing secrets, and spread the message of personal potential. All right, welcome everybody to the universe between your ears. I'm Tim Starr with my co-host Gabi Mushev. Hi, hi, hello to everyone. There he is, and we have a fun uh, guest tonight. I've been looking forward to doing this. His name is Sean Douglas. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Sean first, and then we'll let him actually speak. Um, Sean's a U.S. Air Force veteran, master res- resilience implementer, TEDx speaker, international radio show host, performance enhancement expert and an author he inspires and motivates you to live your brand so you can grow personally and professionally and millennials to 50 year old professionals hire sean to teach them mental physical social emotional spiritual resilience skills that empower them to withstand recover and grow through adversity stress and life's changing demands it's done in a highly interactive and engaging environment utilizing online coaching sessions and face-to-face workshops Sean equips people with the tools necessary to live epic lives and leaves people better equipped to manage change effectively. Now he shares his powerful testimony on stages globally and sends the message that at any point you have the power to say, this is not how my story ends. Sean, welcome. Dude, thanks for having me, man. Welcome, Sean. Took us a little while to get this together somehow, but... (laughs) Guys, epic is an acronym, right? You said epic lives. Oh yeah, man. You got to live an epic life. It, but it's it, all in caps. Does that stand? Is that an acronym? Or, uh, does no, that, man. Epic, oh, like in, okay. in all Just caps, emphasis. means in like, caps. like okay, the guys. emphasis on like <laughs> the badassery of of like living an epic life. I'm gonna try epic, to damn make, it. I'm like gonna try epic. to make it an acronym. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, yeah, somebody cool. has, I'm sure. I am an ac- I am an I am an acronym junkie, man. You know uh, what I mean? I mean, I'm sure you can come up with something off the top of your head. You know what yeah. I mean? It's only four letters. It can't be that bad. Right. So, all right, man. So let's, let's, uh, let's get I already got an acronym for it. I already got an acronym for it. (laughs) Are you ready to talk about one? Yep. (laughs) Every day providing invaluable content. There you go. There you go. go. (laughs) Asking it is given. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) Every day providing invaluable content. Yeah. All right. Well, Sean and I met at a, a podcasting event and uh, I went really looking to make some contacts, which I did, but um, I came away from that event deciding that I needed to do my own podcast. And Sean, you are a, a piece of why that decision happened. Appreciate that. Um, Thank you. So I, I you know, I, I knew I wanted to, to talk with you and have a longer conversation than anything we were able to do at that event yeah. and, and get into some stuff. You've got a, a, a pretty interesting story. Um, maybe we should start there, kind of give some people some background and then, you know, we may shoot down any side alley as we go here sure. tonight, but, um, you know, so it, it's... It's the Wild West when we get started sometimes. Anything goes. <laughs> anywhere it, we want to take it. We, we don't have any particular real, place we got to ge- get to. So Yeah, man. Genuine conversation, man. Yeah, that's the that's best. That's where the best stuff. Dude. Those are the best. The best stuff comes. Yep. So fill people in. Anybody that doesn't know who you are and how you came to be here, bring us all up to speed. Man, it's a long road, man. It's a long road. And I'm only 34. I feel like I've been through 50 years worth of stuff, man. Uh, and most of it was self-induced. A lot of it was self-induced, you know. Um, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, really rough. Mom and dad divorced when I was in first grade. Dad joins the Air Force. Mom goes and um, hooks up with another guy. Turns out from second grade to seventh grade, he's a uh, womanizer, uh, abuser, uh, of, uh, abuser of people, abuser of, um, of drugs and alcohol. So my childhood was an alcohol-dominated domestic violence household. You know, cops are called all the time. Uh, growing up, never felt love, never felt – it's like, go in your room. Like, it's time for bed. Go in your room, you know. And then we just hear shouting and screaming and then hitting and mom crying. And, I mean, that's what I, you know, that's what I grew up with. 
Um, from the time that I was, um, you know, back as far as I can remember, kindergarten, first grade, uh, up until 18, uh, I've lived in 11 different houses and I attended eight different schools. In third grade, uh, we got evicted from our house, moved in with my grandparents to finish out the last like eight weeks of school in third grade, then moved out of that school. <laughs> so I was literally in school for like six to eight weeks. Like that was it. And then I went to a different school and a different house, you know, uh, for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. And that's really where it got, um, got really bad. You know, I remember shoveling snow for $60 um, just so we could um, go buy dinner. You know what I mean? And, I, and, I, and my mom and I have talked about this before. It's like, I will never forget. I will never forget. Um, you know, I came home with that $60, like 7.30 at night, you know, snowing. Got done shoveling a bunch of driveways, you know, for 5 or $10 a piece you know, by myself. And, uh, you know, I called my mom into the, to the back room, you know, three bedroom house, single story brick ranch. And, uh, you know, I called her in the back. I was like, look, look, look. And I showed her like $60. I had a bunch of fives and tens out of 20 or something. It's like, wow, that's really great. I'm like, like, don't, don't, don't show him. Like we need to hide this. So he doesn't, so he doesn't see it. Like, hmm. like it's our money, mom. It's our money. You know, like, cause he would go around and rummage through all of our stuff, trying to find money and, you know, whatever he could to, you know, he, he pawned our bikes, you know, he, um, stole my mom's jewelry. And I mean, it's just, it's what, that's what addicts do, man. That's what yeah. addicts do. And so, um, you know, seventh grade, um, was, was the tipping point it was like the end, man. Like the cops got called so much, you know what I mean? Um, it was just, it was just time that, that, you know, changes be made. So a lot of people had a hand in, uh, in, in breaking up that marriage and getting my mom and us, you know, out of that house and, back into my grandparents' basement and, um, you know, we lived there for a good solid two years, I guess. And then we moved into another house with another guy and he wasn't any better. And, you know, so I graduated high school with a 1.8 because I didn't have a care in life. I never, I was, wasn't, I wasn't raised, you know, to have a, have a purpose. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was, you know, do what you can to survive. I mean, really, it was do what you can to survive, you know? Um, but 9-11 happened and then I joined the military and, been in the air force ever since, you know, I've built three businesses while on active duty. Uh, military is probably the best thing that ever happened to me. However, um, when you don't deal with things properly, even though I was in counseling, you know, from a kid to, you know, a teenager that was in counseling, you just, there's a lot of things you suppress. There's a lot of things that you don't realize you remember until you're alone in a room you know, drunk, you know, looking at yourself in the mirror and wondering, you know, who is this person? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I then became addicted to alcohol and, uh, and it almost, you know, took my life, you know? Um, so 2008, um, you know, sitting in, in our, in our house, my wife left me and, and took the kids and, um, I sat there with a bottle of Jack Daniels in one hand and a loaded nine millimeter in the other. And, uh, I made a, I made a decision you know, a drunken decision in Christmas Eve, 2008, I was like, I'm just, I'm going to take my life. Like, I, I can't keep doing this. You know, I can't overcome, I, even though I've been to rehab, you know, I can't, you know, I can't stop drinking. I, I'm, I'm a whore, like, I'm horrible to people. Like, like I'm the guy who, you know, you said that your podcast is like the universe between your ears or whatever. Like I would be the guy to like try to one up you and be like, well, I'm going to create a podcast called universe between your head, you know, or <laughs> universe you know, inside of your ears or like, I would yeah. just try to like, I would just try to be better. Like my goal is to try to be better than people in like a negative way. You know what I mean? Like I yeah. was the one upper, like the Mario brothers. Like I was the one up guy, you know, nobody wanted to hang out with me. No, I mean, I just hung out with people who were like me. They were addicts. They were people who were operating at a low level. And so, uh, you know, I, I just didn't want to live like that no more. Like I just, I, I just didn't want to. And so as I'm looking at a picture of the wife and kids and like, how did, I was like, why is my life so screwed up? And I'm looking back at, you know, I, I miss my family at home and I grew up rough. I was just, you know, I was, I was just in a deep depression and feeling sorry for myself. I'm like, I'm just, I'm turning out to be him. You know what I mean? Yelling and screaming at the wife, yelling and screaming at the kids. You know, I didn't, I didn't hit her, you know, but um, that would have been, that would have been too much for me. But, um, you know, drinking all the time and just being stupid and doing, doing stupid things. So I just, I decided to end it, you know, so um, so Christmas Eve, 2008, you know, I put the gun in my mouth. Like I'm done, man. I'm just, just, I'm just done. Like I, I already made peace with it. Like I was, I was beyond done. Like I was, I was at peace. Like I, I don't have to feel this way no more. You know what I mean? Yep. It was almost a relief. 
that it, like this like this is it like i don't like there is an out you know what i mean like there is an out you know but um enough people cared about me and uh so um i got phone calls and and people came to the house and I got more phone calls and you know my dad called and and um you know i'm explaining to him everything and you know some other people and you know, like, dude, like, how did you let it get this far? Like, what and what happened? You know, I'm trying to explain to them everything that I was feeling, and I didn't believe in myself. I didn't think I was worthy. I didn't. I didn't feel like I mattered. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. w- when that, you start that, hearing, that time, uh, Sean, I'm sorry. At that time, yeah. were you active duty or you? Yeah. Were, you yep. Were yeah. You know, when you when when you hear someone say, um, you know, always, never. You know, I, I always, I never. You know, like, like the absolutes and then couple that with, you know, I always mess everything up. Nobody would ever care about me. You see what I'm saying? Like when you start hearing like the absolutes and the negativity, you know, and blaming yourself on things, dude, that is a, that is a great uh, recipe for suicide. You know, someone says, I I always mess things up. I'm never going to be good enough. You know, like Mm -hmm. that's that, that type of talk, man, I'm telling you, um, it starts to lead down that road. And that's, man, I was, I was, I was there, you know what I mean? So, you know, fast forward six months, you know, I've been going to classes. I've, um, you know, I've been working with chaplains and therapists and I mean, just, just dealing with things that I carried around, you know, watching my mom get beat, watching my sister get thrown down a hallway, uh, me getting thrown into a wall. Um, you know, we had paddles with our names on them. You know, we had, we didn't have you know, elf on a shelf. We had a belt on a shelf. You know what I mean? It was just, man, it's just not a great way to live. You know what I mean? And so I, I had to deal with a lot of things, you know, cause I just buried it. So I became a drill instructor. Uh, my commander said, dude, you have an awesome testimony. You should be a drill instructor. I said, you're crazy. Like that's, <laughs> that's not like, you don't want me to be a drill instructor because I'm still broken. And, um, so I became a drill instructor, and from 2009 to 2013, I was a drill instructor for Air Force Basic Training. I, um, man, I loved it. Like that—that was, that was probably the most passionate thing I've ever done. You know, like I found my passion for speaking. I found my purpose. You know, and, and as I look back at everything that has happened, you know, in 2014, um, after I was done, I became a master resilience implementer. You know, implementing resilient skills in not only my life but everybody else. Like I use these skills like all the time, like like every day. I'm not one of the guys who says, "Oh yeah, try this; it works." You know, but I haven't tried it mm-hmm. myself. Like I, I do these skills. And I know they work. You know, and so the big thing is like I had to have a testimony. I had to learn how to tell that testimony, mm-hmm. speaking, training, you know, in basic training. I had to have positive psychology, fact-based research, a program, resilience, something that, that coupled it all together. Mm-hmm. And here I am now, you know, with my own show. I just recently got a TEDx talk. You know, I've been speaking on stages since 2015 professionally, you know, during – Previous to that, it was, you know, hey, this high school wants you to speak there. Mm-hmm. All right. Hey, go to this college. This college got a, a junior ROTC program uh, or an ROTC program, you know. Uh, they want you to speak there and, you know, kind of kind of you know, hit up that awards banquet, you know, like, cool, let's do it. You know, never mm-hmm. never ask for payment, never, you know. People offer it. I'm like, I, I mean, a couple hundred bucks, you know, whatever. They're like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But uh, now, I mean, I'm, I'm getting booked everywhere, man. I've got cool. more more speaking engagements that, that I, than I have time to do. Good. You know, the aim, so it's the goal. Is that is so, that now is that your main uh, um, activity or do you still? Do yeah, I'm still in the military. In the military, I got four years to go, and and so my military pay goes and funds my my side business. Got you it. know, so what what have you what have you been doing in the air force uh, just uh, yeah so i'm a i'm an aircraft maintainer um i work on the f-15 and i've also worked on uh f-16s a-10s um f-22s oh my my so yeah I've, I've, aircraft man, man, yeah yeah, you know, yeah man I was, Crew chief. I was growing up i was growing up surrounded by those interesting glass uh, airplane models i don't know yeah. if you do that they they spend hours making these polishing mm-hmm. that glass and making this beautiful like um, sure. You know, sculptures. I don't know what they call them. Statues, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I, I basically fix them, tear them apart, fix them, you know. So uh, it's good times. 
I want to ask about something. Sean, uh, they're cause... drinking heavily in that in the, in the airport. <laughs> I'm sorry. My you guys are great. Was, you my guys are great. Saying that uh, when they didn't have any access to whatever alcohol, they used that the the alcohol that was supplied to them for the uh, you know the, for defrosting the wings. You know, there there is alcohol. Yeah, sir. Yeah, the de-icing fluid, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, oh my God. And that's yummy stuff. It's nasty. Oh, it's nasty <laughs> stuff. Sticky, nasty. It's pink. That's gross. All right, well, I want to ask you something because we, uh, just this past week, we interviewed somebody else with a similar story to yours, also in the Air oh. Force. Really? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. But his, his th what turned him around, he, and he went through child abuse when he was a kid and developed the, the mindset that he's a piece of crap and um, it carried into, uh, you know, it led into addictions, carried into the service, only got worse while he was in the service. Yeah. And part of his story is that he talked with chaplains and ministers and whatever was available in, in the Air Force, yeah. but he said it was all, it was, it was therapy-based. The model was therapy-based and it was, you know, what's bothering you? Oh, here's my thing. Okay, so well, let's talk about. Here's the the addiction the yeah the addiction model. Here's the, the mechanics of it. And I'll go read this book and come back and we'll talk again. You know, and he huh. said he got a little bit out of help out of it, but it really never got beyond that. When he got out, he went to a rehab facility uh, in the private sector, and they came at it from a coaching model, right? And asking questions and, and wouldn't wouldn't allow him to own his victimhood and, and that kind of stuff sure. and that really just was you know it was a completely different world uh, in terms of how you address the stuff and that really that changed his life for him I'm not hearing the yeah. same thing from you no so no you're, mine you're, was more mine was more chaplain based you know like I, I mean I talk to the chaplains all the time you know I mean? and, and I wasn't um, so because at the time you know I mean, I was cursing God, you know, I was raised Roman Catholic, you know what I mean? So I was cursing him like, oh, it's your fault that you did this and you did this and, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, I went to mental health and I, you know, because we, we, like you take classes, you know what I mean? Like, like, why are you feeling the way that you're feeling and why do you do this? And why do you like, this is why and this is, you know, but what did it for me was, was really like, like the non-judgmental, like, oh, here's another mental health case, you know, mm. it, I mean, we, yeah, I mean, you know, it was, it was anger management. I took, you know, I went to anger management, um, you know, went to ADAP, which is the alcohol and drug, you know, dependency and prevention of prevention and treatment. Um, you know, you go through like a two week period of that, you know, that's supposed to break you of, of those addictions or whatever, you know what I mean? Cause you pretty much like when, <clears throat> when you're in there, they'll tell you like, if you drink, you're going to jail. Like you're in this military program. If you drink, you're going to get removed from the program, removed from the Air Force, and you're going to go directly to jail, not collect $200 as you pass go. Mm -hmm. You know? So it's kind of like, all right, well, this is getting pretty serious. I mean, I was charged with an Article 112 uh, of the UCMJ, the Uniform Court of Military Justice, which is drunk on duty. <laughs> um, I was charged with an Article 112. And that was the moment where I'm like, this, this can't. Like this can't happen. Like this is this is really bad. Mm. You know what I mean? So um as as the military police are are reading me my rights and signing over the paperwork and you know, LORs and like you know, just giving me all of that stuff, you know, I'm like, what do I do? Mm. This this there's gotta be another way. So it was more chaplain based and I still kind of like I wanted to believe in God, but I was like, eh, I don't know. So kind of well, I don't know. It, it it goes to the idea that um, there is no one method for people sure. to to travel our you know our our paths. Everybody's right. You know, there's lots of overlap in different areas for different people, but it's going to be unique for all of us. Yep. So, yeah. Very true. Very true. So how I read your book. Um, I think you left out a few pieces in telling your story here, but, um, <laughs> Tim, what's the title of that book? Yeah. So the title of my book is called decisions, mm -hmm. the power to overcome self-defeating behaviors. The power to overcome 
self-defeating. Yeah, everybody has self-defeating behaviors. Everybody knows. Mm. Everybody has one or two, whether it be OCD or, um, you know, you concentrate on, any, on someone else's blessings rather than counting your own. Um, you've got an alcohol addiction. You've got, I mean, there's, there's everybody has a self-defeating behavior. People worry too much. You know, it's the self-defeating behaviors are, are, are things that you do to yourself. Self-sabotage. How you think, cause, cause thoughts, feelings, and beliefs drive all reactions. Period. Thoughts, feelings, and beliefs drive all of your reactions. How you think about yourself. Most importantly, if you put more weight into what people think about you than what you think about you, that is an issue. That is a self-defeating behavior. shouldn't matter what people think about you because you have the self-esteem, not the esteem of other people, the self-esteem. But where does that come from? Yeah. By being built up by your parents, by being built up by a significant other who tells you that you're loving and beautiful and you're amazing and you're, you know, that's where affirmations come in. You can actually affirm yourself. It's one of the one of the five love languages. If you can figure out what your love language is, then you have a better chance of having a healthy relationship. You just have to figure out what your love language is. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. yeah so, so there's five love languages um, that everybody everybody has five love languages. But but what do you rely on the most? Affirmations is mine. If my wife tells me how amazing and awesome I am. I'm probably going to do a lot of stuff around the house. Like you're amazing. You're awesome. You know, whatever. Um, when I go to sleep, I don't want to be touched. Like, leave me alone. Like, I don't want to hold you. I don't want to cuddle. Like I'm trying to go to sleep. Like, let me get my space. Let me crawl into the crease that's in the center of my mattress. You know what I'm saying? And let me go to sleep. She wants to be held, has to be held, has to be touched, has to be. So I know that her love language is touch. And so the other one is, is acts of service. You know, some people, you have like, well, if I could just do something for that person, you know, if I could write them a card or if I could, you know, just show them gratitude, whatever, like acts of service. Another one is gifting, you know? So, so people will buy, like, like if somebody gifts a lot of things, like that's, that's how they show their, their love language. You know what I mean? I know a lot of people are like, Hey, I got you something. I'm like, Whoa. But you get like you don't have to get me to think, no 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 I really mm. wanted to I'm like okay that's fine yeah. like like don't destroy someone's love language you know what I mean mm. so you have touching affirmations um, gifts acts of service and then quality time mm -hmm. so a lot of people do quality time like oh from eight to ten we're gonna watch a movie it's family night it's you know my wife loves the quality I don't know what what she loves more either the touching or the uh quality time um but sometimes it's just we're sitting on the couch and she's kind of like leaned over into me and i'm got my arm around her and we're watching a movie you know whatever other times you know she's like hey let's just go on a drive like christmas lights let's go on a drive let's go you know yeah. um let's like road trips are awesome so quality time you know what i mean so it just depends on on how you want to be loved because when someone is loving you according to your love language, you will have a healthier relationship. And when you mm -hmm. two in a, in a relationship can understand each other's love language, you are then like, if I know my wife is like trying to cuddle on me and touch me, whatever, like she wants, like that's her cue. You know what I mean? To tell me, you know, like, Hey, I want, you know, my love language reciprocated. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I, I'm just pretty receptive. They have one for kids too. Um, they have five love languages of kids and you can see how your kids want to be loved. You know what I mean? If they're always mm -hmm. in daddy's lap or if they're, you know, always affirming you like, daddy, you're so amazing or whatever. Like that's their, that's their love language. Yeah. So isn't that, that's, so that's also how they want to be exactly. treated too, right? Yep. Yeah. Because we, we tend to, I think, view everyone else with the same Yeah, mind, we, put same in, parameters we put people in a box, under. man. <clears throat> we, we, we put people in a box sometimes, you know, and we just say, you know, this is the way that I want things and this is the way that I expect you to be and this is what you are and we've defined them by putting them in this box, you know, and it's, it's just not the case. Yeah. You, you were cool. saying just earlier, um, Sean, that, uh, you know, alcohol addiction is like, is a direct result of, uh, you were saying, compulsive, uh, compulsive thinking, right? Compulsive thinking. Uh, which itself is a, is an addiction, right? So then, if, if at the core of this <clears throat> substance uh, addiction, there is compulsive thinking addiction, right? And now you're addressing that compulsive thinking addiction uh, as the root cause, right? Yeah. Um, 
then you need like and then i guess you need to identify okay can you uh see where this person is compulsively robotically following a certain pattern and i guess you know for the most people these are like programs that came to them from childhood like you were describing right so then i mean you were growing up with the programs with, with those programs right and now they're not now they're like in your subconscious right how do you remove those programs they're so powerful i mean do, do you address that in, in any of your work right you know things that are really ingrained now in you yeah. the programming was done right i mean right so how could you override something so powerful yeah so there's there's two things that come to mind and it's funny that you that you say that because i just delivered my tedx talk on just this very topic mm -hmm. right and, and it was called hacking your brain for success how to rewire your brain to be uh -huh. successful, right? And so, like I said before, it starts with what's in our brains. Think, feel, and believe, okay? So what we think about the world, what we think about ourselves. So thoughts, feelings, and beliefs drive all reactions. Every time you see something negative on social media, like, oh my gosh, like that's so wrong. It's so like, that's what they believe, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, you know, what about, you know, well, I feel like, you know, this is like, cause we feel like when we see things on TV and the news and everything, like, I don't think that that's right. Like that doesn't, doesn't feel right. Right. Like we, we have an internal compass, like that doesn't feel right. But then, you know, we turn around and go, well, that's not right because we know that this has been programmed. Like this is against the law and this is this, this is this. But most of the time it's always about, well, I believe that, you know, whatever. And people try to put their beliefs on other people. Well, I believe that this is the right way and it needs to be this way and you know, whatever. But where does that come from? Like nobody, nobody wakes up and says, I want to fail at everything, right? Nobody wakes up and says, I think I'll be racist today. I think I'll be, you know, the worst person ever in the world today. Like that's just what I'm going to do. Nobody wakes up in, in, you know, in the morning with a conscious decision says, you know what? Today's the day. Today's the day I start living an epic life. Today's the day. Like it just, you don't just wake up and do that. You know what I mean? There's always got to be like, where does it come from? So a lot of our decisions are based on uh, familiarity. A lot of our decisions are based on what we were told as kids, right? Uh, past experiences, experiences in similar situations, our family, culture, right? Plays a huge role. Um, you know, I don't necessarily maybe take my shoes off when I walk through a door, but then I know uh, some of my friends who are like from Asia, like that's the first thing they do is they take their shoes off. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. um, I know people that... Um, who, you know, they pray at every meal. Let's say they pray at every meal, you know, because they're Christian. Uh, that's what we do. Um, I've been to people's houses with like, here, here's your food and, you know, dig in or whatever. And my family's sitting here like, we're supposed to, like, we can't, we're supposed to pray first, you know. Mm -hmm. That's just our, our way of doing things. That's our culture. You know, that's not that family's way of doing things. So you have to know why you think, feel, and believe the way you do and where it came from. Mm -hmm. And where mine came from was that my parents said, this is the, like when we, when we parent our children, you start saying things that your mom said, right? Like my mom always said, well, I brought you into this world. I can take you out. You know, like mm -hmm. <laughs> every time I got in trouble, I will take you out of this world, you know? And as I grew older, I'm like, is she talking about killing me? Like, is she's going to, like, she's going to kill me? <laughs> like for real? You know what I mean? Or they have something, you know, very clever to say as they're, as they're, you know, swatting you with a belt or something, you know? But where does it all come from? And you have to figure out why you think, feel, and believe the way you do. It's not like, like we're not born racist. We're not born hateful. We're not born loving either. Mm -hmm. Everything we do is a learned behavior. Everything. Everything we do in life is a learned behavior. There's a research study called the uh, London Cab Driver um, Research Studies. London Cab Driver Study. So uh, Eleanor McGuire and Catherine Woolett from the University, from the Neuroimaging um, College of London, the University of London, followed 79 cab drivers around. And it's a brutal process that takes about three to four years in order for those cab drivers, the trainees, to become successful. I mean, it takes three to four years. It's a brutal training process. Mm -hmm. They took 31 other people as their control standard, right? It had nothing to do with cabbies. They were lawyers, doctors, you know, pharmacists, whatever. And so what they did was they looked at what they were doing for training, okay? 
And the end of course exam is called the Knowledge of London Examination System. So these trainees, these cab driver trainees, have to memorize London's roads. Okay, they get the GPS for a little bit and it's gone. Like you have to memorize it. It takes three to four years to do this, okay? In that time, those two uh, researchers took MRIs of everybody's brains and the ones that passed that test, and some of them took up to 12 times to pass that last test, mm -hmm. up to 12 times. So in this particular study, half of the training cab drivers actually passed that test and the ones that did the brain's area in the hippocampus, which is located under the cerebral cortex, it has something to do with short-term, long-term spatial memory and our internal navigation, okay? That part of the brain was significantly larger than every other part of the, part of the brain and significantly larger than the ones that failed and significantly larger than the ones that did not participate in the cab driver training. So what they, what they concluded is that everything we do is a learned behavior and with regiment and with a, a training regimen, okay? You can actually rewire your brain's neuroplasticity and your brain's nerve cells to actually relearn a new behavior and relearn a new way of doing things. You can unlearn what you've already had and you can rewire your brain's neuroplasticity to learn new information. So the whole thing that you can't teach a dog new tricks is absolutely false. Right. At 60 years old, you can learn new things, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, it's not yeah. that you don't stop learning, right? I, I just have to add to this, uh, Sean. There's this guy, uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton. Um, uh, he, he is uh, an amazing guy. He wrote many books. But what he was saying that, you know, the traditional psychologists, they think that going back to the root cause and, you know, kind of identifying what made you uh, learn those, um, you know, self-defeating programs, right? No. Um, is unnecessary. As a matter of fact, it's not productive at all. Don't go to the root cause. Don't spend time there at all. It doesn't help you overcome. The understanding of where they came from does not help you over overcome them, right? Just go to exactly where you were saying, right? Uh, straight there. Don't even waste time going to try and overanalyze. As a matter of fact, if you keep thinking about that, you are attracting more of that energy hmm. because what you think about is what you're experiencing. You're attracting, you know, the, right. laws, the laws of the universe. So why go and revisit this and relive it emotionally? It's probably not a good idea. I'll tell you why. Yeah. Because of, because what they're doing, excuse me, <clears throat> what they're doing it, um, is called the white bear phenomena. It's another research study. It's called the white bear phenomena. What they've done is that, Basically, we try to mask our, our thoughts and we try to bury feelings that are uncomfortable, right? Like if you have a bad breakup, like I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about it. And what are you doing? You're thinking, You're thinking about, about it. You're thinking about it. So basically, you know, Tony Ramos famously said, where focus goes, energy <clears throat> flows, right? <clears throat> if you focus on not thinking about something, what are you doing? You're putting energy towards not thinking about it. And guess what you're doing? You're thinking about it. So what this research study did was he said, well, well, what's the best way? Like, how do, we, how do we not think about things? Like, how do, we, how do we get those negative thoughts? Like, how do we get to the root cause? And, and, and what do we got to do? Acceptance. Okay. Acceptance and acknowledgement. Once we, yes, I'm having these thoughts. Like, even if it's suicidal thoughts, like, I'm having, like, why? Why am I having these thoughts? Like, I don't understand. It's like, oh, no, I don't want those. I don't want those. No, nope, I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to think about that. And you end up thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So it's just accepting that you will have uncharacteristic thoughts at some point in your life, whether you've thought about hurting somebody or hurting yourself, you've thought about, you know, um, guys with like porn addictions, you know, they think about like, Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. And you know what I mean? But acceptance is not about getting rid of the grief, the loss, the, you know, whatever it's not, it's not about getting rid of the thoughts. Right. It's about not applying that energy that you're talking about, not applying energy to that root cause anymore. It's wow. This is what happened. This is why I'm thinking about what I'm thinking about. And I need to acknowledge that. Okay. And now I need to move forward. And that's what, that's all they're doing. All they're saying is, look, acknowledge why acknowledge those thoughts. Don't try to hide them. Acknowledge those thoughts. Like, wow, I had this weird thought in my head. Like, what is that? And then it's gone. And then you don't think about it no more. And, and I do that every time. Every time I'm thinking about something, I'm like, why, 
like, what is that? Like, why am I thinking about it? that's so mm-hmm. dumb? You know what I mean? And I don't obsess over like, oh my god, I gotta find out why. I gotta figure out. I don't do that. But what I do is I'm like, why am I thinking about that? That was super weird. You know what I mean? And I and I'm thinking about it for a couple of minutes. I'm like, huh? Like something like ten years ago. Give me something. 10 years ago. I'm like, why would I think about that? That was pretty crazy. And then I go back to what was I thinking, feeling, and believing at that time? Mm-hmm. What am I thinking and feeling, believing about that situation right now? If I go back twenty years and I and, and I look at it, I'm like, wow, I really wasn't on a good place back then and and i was thinking like really stu- stupid i was like wow that man so now i need to take steps forward in order to not go back to that place that's acceptance and it's and, huge and, and letting go of judging yourself right yes yourself. Yeah. yes that's ex- yes it, don't ever try to suppress anything you know, if you're feeling, that's where journaling comes in. Holy moly. If you don't journal, man, you're way behind the, you're way behind the power curve. That's, that's part of my, my wife keeps telling me, but I just can't, I'm so lazy. I'm a visual guy. So she writes a lot of, you yeah. know, every day. I'm like, where do you get the energy to do this? Just I, write down in the morning. So, so what I do in the morning is I write down what I'm, what I'm thinking, feeling and in my phone. I'll take some, I'm like, I'm like texting, you know, I'm, you know, or you just write it down. That's how I wrote my book. I wrote down a bunch of stuff and uh, I've yeah. got like, I've got like papers like all over my desk of like just notes that I've taken. Just, that's a weird thought, you know, write it down and then, it, and then it passes and then it's gone. It's not, it's not inside no more. You yeah. got to get the junk out. You know what I'm saying? You got to get the junk out. They, a, a study said that you have 16,000 thoughts a day. Uh, 16,000. I'm like, that's not even, that isn't even, like, how do you even measure that? <laughs> like, yeah, how do you even measure that? Like, are you doing something while thinking about something? That's are you thinking about something while thinking about something while thinking yeah. about something? Like, how does yeah. that? I'm not well, even we not. have, there's, uh, it's in the movie, uh, What the Bleep Do We Know? They talk about how much data is coming into our systems. Oh, yeah. Every second of the day. And it, it's this huge, it's like, you know, it's the Library of Congress coming into your mind every I don't know every minute or something and but our brains filter out yep everything except what agrees with our already existing programs yep exactly so we keep reinforcing those programs good or bad and so things only get worse yeah but you got you know but that cab driver research man it's 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 that pivotal moment that they said wow you can actually train your brain like everyday habits right everyday habits that you do every single day you know um eric thomas great speaker said greatness is a lot of small things done well day after day workout after workout obedience after obedience it's every single day doing one small thing to get you to where you want to be and and it becomes a habit so do you have positive habits or negative habits why do you think smoking is so hard to break you know, doctors like, oh well, you know, the nicotine and that. No, yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's the hand brain. to the right. It's the hand to the. You know what I mean? Think about alcohol. Do you know why I loved alcohol so much? It wasn't because I'm I'm chemically addicted. Like, come on, you know what it is? You see people having fun. You're emotionally connected to the alcohol. Yeah, chemically, there's some things that you know your body wants it, and I'm not ever going to dispute science. But I will tell you that during New Year's Eve, I really want some alcohol because I equate that good time to mm-hmm. having alcohol. Because when you're in a bar, what are you doing? You're not having fun while drinking soda. You're having fun <laughs> taking shots. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, what a great night. Oh, my God. And like all of your, your inhibitance is gone, man. You're a free will spirit. You're, you're drunk. You're wasted. You're like carefree and not even – you know what I'm saying? But then some people – they get drunk and all the childhood memories come flooding back in. And that is not a great place to be. And that's where I was headed. So, uh, you know, there's an emotional response to everything. Yes. Chemical addictions got it, but there's also an emotional response. You know what I mean? And I loved drinking and partying and having a good time. And I mean, that's what I equate and that's what I craved because to me, not feeling valued when I was drinking with people, we were, close and tight knit and it was a good time and i felt loved and then what happens everybody leaves and you're left in an empty house and they gotta do it all over and it's a vicious cycle you do it over hey come back over tomorrow come back over tomorrow we're having a party yeah you know what i mean so hi this is tim Starr. thanks for joining me and gabby on the, the universe between your ears 
We really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us for a little while. And we'd like to see you again. So be sure to subscribe wherever it is you're consuming the podcast from, whether it's YouTube or Stitcher or iTunes or whatever the hell else is out there. We want to see you again. We also want to hear from you. So let us know what you think of each episode. Let us know if you've got an idea for a future episode that you think would be just killer. Absolutely, let us know. All right. Thanks again, and we will see you next time around. Bye-bye.